Peace. This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. This is your film and music show, and uh, unfortunately, um, Jayla Six's not uh, able to join us at this time, but uh, we do have a wonderful guest with us. We're returning to Camp Crystal Lake, and we're going to talk uh, um, to the... I have to say, one of the most gorgeous women ever to walk into that series. Welcome, Melanie Kenneman. Oh, hello. How kind you are. What a great introduction. Yes, you were in Part 5, A New Beginning. You were Pam Roberts. That's correct. I'm going to give you a little backstory about the first time I saw this movie. Okay. Um. I was not 18 when I first saw Friday the 13th. In fact, my cousins were a little devious. And uh, I'm I'm 43 now, so I grew up with the movies. But um, I remember my cousins and my older brother, they were a little on the mischievous side, and they were watching Friday the 13th Part 2. And um, needless to say, that film became the first time I'd actually seen a naked female body. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and after like three killings, that was the scene that my mother ran in and turned the television off on when uh, Kirsten Baker goes across the lake there in the nude. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was my the first introduction to uh, female nudity at that time. So I had a lot of questions that my folks weren't going to answer. <laughs> right. Good old Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> there you go. But um, I remember that my my uncle owned a video store way back in the early and mid-80s, and we had saw parts two, three, and four. And it wasn't until, like, junior high. Can can you imagine junior high when you're watching these movies? (laughs) No, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and and I was invited to a birthday party and with some classmates, and none of us had seen part one. And this was back when the first six were released. And none of us had seen part one, so we had no idea about the Mrs. Voorhees situation. And uh, we, uh, they had seen parts five and six, but uh, I hadn't. So they rented parts one, five, and six. And I remember before we watched part five, like they weren't big fans of the fact that it wasn't Jason in it. So they said to me, they said, you might, I don't know how you'll feel about the movie, but we guarantee you, you will love the leading lady. <laughs> oh, how nice. <laughs> and I remember when that, um, you know, Tommy had his nightmare when he was young Corey Feldman and then John Shepard awakens and the ambulance driver opens the door. And I remember when you first appeared, I like, I'm going to tell you, my heart started fluttering. You were a sight to see. Yeah, so I have to oogle a little bit. You, you, I've seen recent pictures of you, and you are still a stunningly beautiful, gorgeous woman. Oh, why, thank you. I'm so glad I'm on this show. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Compliments being hurled at me. It's fantastic. Well, there you go. Um, what, what advice do you have for women out there? I mean, you've kept yourself up well. What advice do you have for them? Well, you know, it's, simp- it's really basic stuff. First of all, you have to be happy and try to enjoy your life. That's number one. But you really have to uh, watch your health, be careful, you know, uh, eat well. Now, we all eat not perfectly. Obviously, we have fast food and things all over America and where you are, all over the world now. But you really should watch on a daily basis what you eat and exercise. It's simple, basic stuff. I'm not saying anything that you haven't already heard, but I'm here to tell you that it works. Okay. Yeah, um, I agree. I actually, um, I haven't eaten fa- fast food in a long time. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, good. I tend to cut that out. But Very important. And even simple things like soda, which, I believe me, I used to like to drink that. Um, I've stopped that. Oh, over 20 years ago, and it's it's really not good for you. It really makes a difference. Things that you think, oh, it's not such a big deal, it really is. When you take it out of your life and out of your diet, you see a difference in how you feel and how you look. And um, it, it builds up. It compounds. The more bad stuff you do, the more it comes to get you later in life. 
So the things you can get away with, you know, in your 20s, 19, 20, even into your 30s, suddenly comes to get you later on. So it's good to start early and create a good lifestyle for yourself so that it's not a big switch later in life. You know, it's interesting because um, I review movies, and I've been doing so since 1996, and I've been doing the show since uh, 2005. And and I'm, I'm going to tell you, one um, group of critics I've clashed with, and my, co- my co-host can say the same thing, is uh, this very conservative group in uh, Los Angeles. And they, of course, attack movies that are too violent or whatever, you know. And uh, I remember they said a comment that I, I, I can't believe they said it. They were talking about the fact that sex and violence, um, advertisers will learn that doesn't sell as much as non-sex and violence advertisements. And they made a comparison I thought was so stupid. They said... Um, that McDonald's cheeseburgers and Coca-Cola, they make lots of money by appealing to families. And I'm like, ask your doctor about that. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. Crazy. I couldn't yeah. believe he, he was attacking yeah. R-rated films over violence. And then this was the comparison. And I am guarantee his doctor would say it doesn't matter whether they advertise to families. You don't want them eating that stuff. Right, right. It doesn't matter who you advertise to, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know who these people are. They're crazy. <laughs> well, I've clashed with them online. In fact, they blocked me because they can't they 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 can't uh they can't give me a a good answer. Right, right. Because they don't really know what they're talking about ultimately, you know. Yeah. But um nonetheless, I've known who you was uh, who you are for I'd say a good, good long time. And uh, I guess my first question for you is, how did you get into the business? Oh, I started out very young. I was um, a dancer, a singer-dancer. And um, I would audition for shows in New York City, and I started dancing in shows in New York and performing from the time I professionally. I started very young, but I professionally, meaning getting paid to do from the age of 16 on. And then I started getting commercials, national commercials, uh, for very big companies, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, things like that. And um, that propelled me into acting, which was my real true passion. Um, So dancing was a kind of a stepping stone to get me into what I really wanted to do. And that was all done in New York City. There was so much going on in the 70s in New York, Um, so many uh, places to to perform, so many places to act, to sing, to dance. It was the hub of everything, New York City. Um, So that's really how I started out. Then I moved to Los Angeles because I got a a part on General Hospital. It started out as a small part in General Hospital shoots in Los Angeles. So I left New York and came here to L.A., And uh, it was supposed to only be uh, six weeks, and I ended up, uh, they renewed the contract, so I was on a little bit longer. In that time, um, I decided to stay here because other jobs were coming my way when the contract was up with uh, General Hospital. And then I started doing some smaller films, and then that took me into where we are now with the Friday the 13th. We haven't seen you, I, like, I haven't seen you dance in any of these films. Like, um, I must ask what uh, kind of dancer you are. Uh, I was a professional dancer, Broadway, those kind of things. I was in a lot of tours of Broadway shows, um, not on Broadway, but they would call them uh, national tours. You know, they called them bus and truck, where you travel across the country doing that sort of thing. And um, the only place you would have seen me dance is if you went to live theater or commercials. I danced in the Dr. Pepper commercials. And then a few years after that, when that contract was up, I danced in uh, Coca-Cola commercials. Uh, there were, in those days, in the late 70s, early 80s, a lot of musical commercials. They don't seem to do them as much now. But it was great for dancers because uh, there were so many places to to do, you know, to dance. Of course, now there's music videos, and then there, there's a resurgence of uh, musical commercials. I'm seeing a lot of them now where the dancers um, are used, and that's a great thing. Do you have a favorite musical? God, there are so many. Oh, I love yeah. Pippin. 
Uh, I did a tour of Pippin. Um, I love Sound of Music, not something I ever was in, just as a person. I love Sound of Music. Great movie. I think it's a very uplifting show, uh, and then ultimately great, great movie. But as a Broadway show, it was great. Growing up, I got to see that. Yeah, that was a great movie. Um, uh, Julie Andrews, Back to Back with Mary yeah. Poppins. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, great. She, she did Mary Poppins the year before, then she got Sound of mm-hmm. Music, so mm-hmm. big stuff for her. Yeah. yeah. I love so musicals I love things well. like that. Yeah. Well, you how know, We did... need more uplifting kind of movies where you go in and, you know, you lose yourself. And there's no major uh, catastrophe or terrible ending, you know. I, I agree with you. I find horror films are, are really bad with that now. Yes. I, I, like, I enjoyed The Conjuring um, a couple of years ago because good, good one over evil. And I hate it yes. when they do that whole, let's cheat the audience and kill off the main person, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it takes away from it, and it's kind of a cheat. It seems popular now, and I don't know, not to get too heavy, I don't know if that's where society is right now, and that's what they're um, uh, playing to, you know, that, uh, that they're, they're gearing everything to the level that we have come to, which is very sad, the uh, negative. I love the movie The Passion of the Christ, but if that was yes. done by today's society, Jesus would have never Forget have risen. <laughs> Forget you Forget it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like enough. I hope things swing uh, swing back. You know, I hope the pendulum swings back, and we get back to a little bit more of um, uh, lighthearted and innocent. It, it would certainly help us as a society. I agree. Is so sour. <laughs> Good over evil. I agree. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in that. So how did your casting come about for uh, Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning? I had um, just finished a film called Thunder Alley. And my agent said, uh, they want to see you for this film. He didn't tell me it was Friday the 13th. So it was just another audition I was going to. And I went in and read. They called me back. They told me pretty early on, I can't remember if it was the second or third audition that they told me it was a Friday the 13th. I understand that other cast members had no idea, but I was told. And it could have been because it was a lead character that they wanted me to to know, you know, what the whole deal was. Um, So the final audition, everybody was there, meaning uh, Frank Mancuso, Danny Steinman, uh, casting, all the and the big wigs at Paramount, and so they had me come in again, meet everybody, and then they asked me to do an improv. And in that improv, I was being murdered by a man with a uh, machete. So I did it, and when I finished, I look. I, I I was lying on the floor. I remember looking up at them. And they were all, their eyes were really wide, you know. And I thought, well, I either did really well and scared them, or they don't know what the hell is going on. So they thanked me very much. They talked to me for a little while. I left, and within hours they called me at home, which never happens because they always call the agent first. And so they said, listen, you're, um, don't tell anybody because we're really supposed to go through your agent, but you got, you got the part. Don't say anything, and we will call your agent, and everything will be official tomorrow morning. Because they called me about 6 or 7 at night. And so I had to wait and keep my big mouth shut until the next day. And then I was able to tell everybody that I got it. And I was very excited. And again, I did know that it was a Friday the 13th. It's interesting you mentioned Thunder Alley. I actually watched that film in preparation for this interview. (laughs) (laughs) I, my one complaint, you weren't in it enough. <laughs> yeah, it's my complaint, too. Well, you know what? These are low-budget things, so they shoot a lot, and then they cut it down. And they wanted to make sure they had room for all the music, all the rock band stuff, which they thought was the most important part of the film. As it turns out, it wasn't. Um, so I think that's why a lot of things were cut. There was a lot of more of the story 
that was cut out. Uh, it was an okay film. Obviously, you saw it, not a great film. It was great for me because I was able to um, show that I could do something different. Well, I thought it was an interesting contrast because in um, Friday the 13th, Part 5, um, Pam Roberts is a very um, responsible person, <laughs> whereas in Thunder Alley, your character Star, very irresponsible, very opposite of Pam. Mm-hmm. Yes. I- yeah, I was the bad one. I was the, uh, the drug dealer, junkie, you know. Uh, which didn't really come out so much in the script. It's much more in-depth, and I am a full-blown junkie, and I get other people hooked. Um, But you only saw a little glimpse of that in the final cut. Yeah, and um, I'm hoping I'm not going into a gray area here, but um, I noticed in... in and one another difference between your two roles in Thunder Alley, you did nudity. You did not in Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I that was a quandary for me. I really, really did not want to do nudity, but I was at a point in my career where I had to make a. You know, I had to do something. Uh, I and in this role, I felt that this role would show that I had some depth. But unfortunately, it required nudity for some of those scenes. So I went back and forth with it. Then I said I wasn't going to do it, and I was going to turn down the role. Ultimately, as you know, I did it. Uh, We tried, my agent and I, to negotiate some of the nudity out because I really didn't think it was important. I knew that the reason the nudity was there was just gratuitous, you know, well, I was thinking too, like like when you're in the swimming pool, like why couldn't they have you have like yeah. a bikini on, or yeah, even when you're in the bedroom scene, why yeah, not a nice sexy bra, you know? Yeah, it was all unnecessary, but I made the choice that I needed this role uh, because you never know. Obviously, I didn't need the role and didn't need to do that because it really didn't do anything for me. But as an actor, you don't know that, so you take what you think is the way to go. The one good thing was uh, Friday the 13th audition came pretty soon after that, and I was ready, if you know what I mean. Okay. I had just come off a film. Um, I had some chops, you know, and I walked into that Friday the 13th audition and nailed it the first time. Yes. And they brought me back, brought me back, and I just nailed it. And I'm not sure if I would have done that had I not had the experience of Thunder Alley, because that was not a really good experience. That whole shoot was not, um, it was very difficult. It was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. And I think it made me stronger as a performer for having gone through that. Um, Not what you see on screen, but what I personally went through as an actor. So I'm not sorry I did it because I think it was uh, instrumental for me, in getting uh, Friday the 13th Part 5. did um, Were they going to push you to do any nudity in Friday Part 5, or were you just, luck- you just lucked out because there is a lot of nudity in that film? No, I, there, was, there was discussion, and um, they didn't really need, they would have liked me have done, to, to have been a little bit more, uh, what's, how do I say? Um, for instance, in the running scenes in the rain, okay. they had me take off my bra, no underwear. So I knew what they were getting at there. They wanted you to be able to see the shirt. Um, I, I, I didn't fight that because I realized that I didn't have to do any other nudity. And in the negotiations, I was not going to do any nudity for them. So I didn't feel that that was such a bad thing. Okay. Well, you know what? Really, when you look back, um, you look at Pam Roberts and you look at her, you in Thunder Alley, I was quite pleased to see the diversity in your performances in both films. So that was well, pretty awesome. Yeah. And, and going back to the nudity thing in Friday the 13th, it was never really written on paper that that was going to happen. Um, we negotiated that I wasn't going to have any nudity. When we started the running sequence, the chase scenes, running in the rain, Danny Steinman said, and perhaps also Frank Mancuso said, take off your bra, 
no bra in these scenes. Now, remember, I'm already in the throes of doing this movie. I had already been shooting for weeks prior to that happening. So I was involved in the character and trying to do the best I could do. So it was not even a – I was was a little bit surprised, but it wasn't a big issue, if you know what I mean. Okay. Why did they want you to take your bra off? Because, again, as you know – I mean, you get your shirt on, so – Well, but these movies – yeah, but you could – What I wasn't thinking at the time, because I'm in the throes of what I'm doing and I'm involved in the character, was I was not aware you could see through the shirt. So now I know why they wanted it. Oh. See what I mean? Yeah, trickery. And again, in hindsight, it was not a big deal. Yeah. Um, But yes, that's what those films want. Well, you mentioned Danny Steinman. Of course, he had directed uh, Savage Street with Linda Blair the year before. What was he like to work with? For uh, for me, it was difficult. Um, everybody had a different take, a different uh, experience with Danny. He treated everybody differently, I noticed. He was very hard on me, but that's okay. I think that also made me stronger in the process of um, of uh, creating that character. Um, yeah. He he let me do, for the most part, what I wanted to do. Everything I brought to the table as Pam Roberts, he didn't cut. I mean, in other words, I he would say action. I would do the scene. And he was happy with what I had done. So there was never really a conflict as to how I was portraying the character. There were conflicts in um, maybe how I saw a certain scene. It was different from how he saw it. But ultimately, he let me do what I what I had chosen to do. And that's what you ended up seeing on the screen. So in that respect, he... He, um, what's the word? He, he saw it. He may not have seen it while we were doing it, but when he looked at it, he saw it my way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. I'm going to tell you one scene that always really gets to me in the film, and I think you'll probably find this funny is um, you get the scene where Jason's coming after you, and you run and you slip and you fall there in the mud. And you're crawling away, and then Jason comes, and he gets you. Tr- you flip over, and you're facing him. And then the the camera goes to him raising the machete to your screaming face, then to the machete raising high, then to your screaming face. It goes back and forth until mm-hmm. finally Shaver Ross comes out uh, in the bulldozer, and I'm like, just shoot the machete rising, a shot of your face, and then him bursting out. And then go. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that yeah. lingers so long. I know it. There were a lot of things. If if I was at the helm, they would have been done differently. But uh, you know, they knew better than than I. <laughs> For instance, the things where the the sweater kept reappearing and I didn't you know, notice that until you and yeah. Gone, it was back. It was gone. It was you know none of that should have been. None of that should have ever happened. None of that should have ever been in the final cut of the film. There were too many people working, too many continuity people to watch and oversee this. I don't know how that ever became the final cut of the movie. Yeah, you kept losing. Your, maybe you went back and picked it up. I don't know. No. no it, it just, I don't know how that slipped by continuity. What was the hardest scene for you to shoot in the movie? Well, it's interesting. It was none of the really, really... Well, the chainsaw scene was difficult for, for a nu- numerous things, uh, technical things mostly. Nothing to do with the acting of the scene. It was all technical stuff. Um, I'd never worked with, obviously, a chainsaw before, and I didn't know how heavy it is, and then they turn it on, it's vibrating, it's five times heavier, you know, and I have to throw it. Um, but the hardest scene, believe it or not, it's always... Um, surprises people when I say it, is the opening scene when you first see me and I walk out and meet Tommy in the uh, in the van. It was the first shot that I'd ever done on the film. It was the first time I was working with Danny, and um, 
his technique and mine were very different. So that simple scene of coming outside, walking to the van, and saying my few lines was one of the hardest things I ever did on that film. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you, if I was at a halfway house and they had somebody looked as beautiful as you there, I'd be cured in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, like, yeah. gee, I'm like, gee, Tommy, why so glum? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what mental illness will do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, the, you mentioned the chainsaw. You used a real chainsaw. Yeah. That was not prop. No, no. And I was, uh, my clothes were wet, and it, they had the rain machines on. So I, my fear was, oh, you know, am I going to get electrocuted here? And it was Halloween night that we shot that. Oh wow! So I didn't know what kind of uh, spirits and vibes were were hovering over us. <laughs> well, at least the actor who played Jason was dressed for the night. <laughs> yep, and Tom Morgan was, uh, you know, he's a very accomplished stunt person, so he was very easy to work with on that. He we we choreographed it so that he didn't get hurt because I was ultimately supposed to throw it at him. So we worked it all out, and he just told me, "Please be very careful." and uh, he showed me how to do many things. So he was very easy to work with, and I was grateful for that. That scene would have been a lot harder if I hadn't had somebody else to do it, you know, with. Okay. He was very understanding. Well, I, I like that scene. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, but I think that's one of the go-to scenes for a lot of fans in that movie as well. So oh, is a, it? Yeah. Interesting. A lot of people, yeah. there's a lot of shots of you online with the chainsaw. Oh, I guess that's the the most famous is a chainsaw scene, yeah. It was pretty unexpected. I mean, you know, everything's quiet, and boom, I come out of the closet. <laughs> there you go. Well, i got to ask you about some of your co-stars from the movie. Um, okay. Shaver Ross. Now, what was he like to work with? Very professional. He was very um, young at the time, uh, but I found him very professional, which surprised me, given his age. He was very quiet, um, but when we worked together, he delivered, as you can see. He did his job, but then in between, there was no conversation. Um, he was very, very quiet, and then I found out years later, that I just thought he didn't like me, and I found out years later that he had a crush on me, and he was afraid to talk to me. We all had a crush on you. <laughs> and I just think that's so funny. I, I had no idea. I just thought he didn't like me. Oh. And it was the opposite. He just, he didn't, he said he didn't know how to talk to me. <laughs> so everything we did on the set, we just were standing there. There was no conversation. And then the director would say, action, and we'd work, and we'd be very intimately involved there. And then when cut happened, boom, done, no conversation. He would go off, I'd go off. So I really never got to know him. I bet you when he looks back now, he likes, he enjoys the fact that he got to lay his head on your lap in those final scenes. Oh, yeah, he said that. And again, it never registered in my brain, you know. But he said that uh, that was a big deal. So you never really know what's going on with the other person because we're all wrapped up in what's going on with us and our role and what we're, do what we're doing. Um, you're never really aware of, the other person's um, reality of what they're going through. Well, you know one thing. I've seen him interviewed online. I guess uh, he's into. Um, I guess he's into the ministry now and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, what I find interesting, um, he mentions he gets a lot of questions about the Reggie the Reckless uh, jumpsuit. And how much how much do you want to bet when if you go to his house he has that frame like a hockey jersey up in his wall? <laughs> well, they had a couple of them. I had a couple of shirts, and he had a couple of those suits because if we had to do retakes, we had to put clean ones on because they were getting muddy and wet and everything. So if we had to go back to redo something, we had to change to where the you know and start over where we weren't wet. So he had a couple of those little red suits. <laughs> well, it's an interesting thing with him. Um, 
I also came from a Christian household, you know, and uh, I grew up in the faith. But one of the things I love about Shaver is um, he's from the faith, but he actually he's not ashamed to have done the film. And I love I respect that about him. Right. That he's right. open to talk about that. Right. right. Yeah. Right. I think that's really cool about him. Another person it I want to. Huh? It, no, it is very. He's, he's a very cool guy. Yeah. Another person I got to ask you about is uh, Tiffany Helm with the cool hair. Yes. <laughs> the punk rock hair. Yep, and that great... I See, I think that scene with her dancing is one of the most memorable, memorable scenes in the film. Um, the song is... Cindy Oh. Yeah, I played it here on the show before. It's um, uh, Those Eyes. Yes. Yeah, I pseudo uh, echo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Couldn't be a better song for that scene or for the movie. And her scene was memorable. I was not there when they shot that. I did not see that scene till I saw the movie. Um, I worked with her. Just a, I think we had just a few scenes together, and we never had conversation really because we would show up on the set. And they stayed isolated, the, the, the actors that were playing the kids in the halfway house. They were pretty much isolated from us. So they would be in their own little group chatting and, and having uh, friendships. And I, John and I were kind of excluded from all of that, which was appropriate for, for the job, for the shoot, for the movie. So I never really got to know her. It's interesting because I heard that originally... Um, she wasn't supposed to be stabbed in the gut. She was supposed hmm. to be stabbed in the vital areas. Yeah, I think they actually shot that. Yeah, I saw pictures uh, from it. Yeah, they shot that, and I think uh, the ratings, uh, they got an X rating for it, so they had to change it. Well, Friday the 13th Part 2 got threatened with an X rating over the double impalement scene. and They, they had... probably all got threatened. Yeah. Except for Part 1. Because I believe they, having not seen them all, but I think they might have gotten gradually more violent. You can tell me that because I really don't know. I haven't seen them all. Well, they've gotten dumber. Just look at Jason X when they I send him to space. <laughs> but I think in the first five, yeah, I th didn't they get progressively more violent? I would say so, yeah. 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 The body count certainly went up. One of the one of the things that Part Five was famous for was the biggest body count at that point, until That's I think something. Jason goes to hell. I think top. Isn't it. that something? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had to cut things out. I had heard uh, things that they had shot that I hadn't seen, but the ratings board gave us an X rating, and they had to go back and cut things out, change things around. So what was shot, and what you see are not the same. I'm going to tell you a couple people I really enjoyed in the film was uh, Carol Locatel and Ron yes. Sloan. Man, Absolutely. they could have done a movie just on them. <laughs> just on them. Uh, they were both great, both great actors, both great people. Yes, um, um, Carol came off of Sharky's Machine. She worked with Burt Reynolds yep. in that. And yep, she'd done a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of great things in Hollywood. And Ron's a great actor also. He's Ron was so, so funny. Yes. So funny. And just so well done, you know. Yeah. They were very easy to work with. Oh, yeah. That, like I said, they could have done just a movie on them, just going back and forth. And I loved Ron Sloan's um, delivery when he would answer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very funny. I loved just, his get up and everything. It was just nice to have some comedy in there. There you go. You know, they need more of that. Yes. Well, are we one of the? Is part five the only one that had that kind of comedy, comic relief? Uh, no, part six did. Oh, it did. Okay. Oh yeah, part six has got some sequence that happens in the woods where you have people playing paintball. Okay. And um, you got one guy who accidentally, like, he's out there looking for his friends, and uh, he puts his hand on a branch. The branch comes off. He tries to put the branch back on the tree. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, yeah, yeah there's absolutely. some comic relief in part six for sure. Oh, okay, okay. But, um... Well, what, more than that. More of that. Absolutely. 
And of course, another person that um, I'm sure just loves the fact that she was in a Friday film because she shares Jason's last name as Debbie Sue, Debbie Sue Voorhees. Debbie Sue, yeah, she's a nice person. She was a lot of fun. I got to know her a little bit on the set, but again, uh, they kept us kind of isolated from the quote-unquote kids who were in the halfway house. So the, another person was uh, John uh, Robert Dixon. It was also a lot of fun. I'm trying to think which one was him. Was he? He the... played Eddie. Uh, oh, uh, that's right. Eddie Sue's boyfriend. Yeah. Absolutely, the one that uh, got the thing Eddie. across the yeah. eyes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He was a lot of fun. He's really, really nice guy. Yeah. Yep. They had that scene out there in the woods where they had uh, Ethel and Junior were all riled up over them going on their property and doing the <laughs> nasty. Yeah, that's a pretty wild scene. I um, glad it wasn't me. <laughs> no. <laughs> John Shepard, easy to work with? Very easy to work with. Uh, very um, intense. A, a very good actor. We, we um, just clicked. So it was a dream. It, uh, very um, wonderful to work with him. And I, got, I don't think you got to work with Corey Feldman. Um, they said that he was supposed to. He wanted to do part five, but he ended yes, up. Uh, yeah, he ended up under contract with uh, Gremlins and Goonies, so wasn't right. able to. But I know he right. wanted to do it. Did you, did you meet him? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. What was he I like? I met him, and then I'm. Uh, yeah, he was uh, again. He was young when, you know, he was still young in those days. So when I met him, he was um, very sweet. And he told me that I was a very good actress and did a great job. And he was very shy. You know, he was just talking to me like that. And he said, I wish I could have worked with you. You did a very good job. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could see more of him, you know. You, you don't see yeah. him much anymore. but Yeah. Well, but... you never know, you know. Yes. Life and show business are weird that way. And then all of a sudden you, you come back out. Yeah, another one I remember from the cat, Juliet Cummings. I haven't seen her since the last day of shooting. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, she got uh, macheted up through the bunk bed. Yep. Yeah. yeah I have not seen her. Um, Mark Venturini was also a great guy. Who Who's that one? Fun guy. He played um, Vic. The guy oh, the, the guy who hatcheted up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's no longer alive, is he? No, no, he. Oh, he passed. Unfortunately, him. passed away. Um, he was young. He was about thirty-five years old. Oh, that's too bad. Great, great guy, though. Yeah. We had fun on, we had fun on the set. He was a lot of fun. But Dominic um, Braska, is that the name of the the guy at the chocolate bar? Yes. Yeah. He, he had a bit part in Once Bitten with Jim Carrey. You see, just a brief second, Jim Carrey uh, wants to lose his virginity to his girlfriend, and he's, in, he's driving an ice cream truck, mm -hmm. and um, she doesn't want to do it, and he wants to do it. Suddenly, there's a knock on the window, and there's Dominique Braska who goes, do you have any such and such ice cream? And he's like, we're closed. Get lost. <laughs> it's always about food with Dominic. <laughs> yeah. I I so sad when I saw him get caught up in the film. It's like you know, not something to lose your head about. Yeah. Yeah. I I I hate seeing anything like that happen. But uh, Dick uh, Wind uh, played um, the uh, ambulance driver Jason mm -hmm. in the film. What was he like? Again, I didn't work with him that much. I had uh, two scenes. One was an action scene. We really didn't speak. I've only gotten to know him uh, in the last couple of years. Oh. I see him at conventions and that sort of thing. Very, very nice guy. But uh, when I was working with him, I think we said maybe three words to each other. It's kind of funny. And now I see him on the circuit, you know, um, at conventions, Friday the 13th, reunions, things like that. One more person, Corey Parker, also in this movie, who had a budding career at that time, and he was one of the fellows that died when the car broke down. He was one that went into that song rap. Oh, yeah. Where you going to rat a tat 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 too Yeah, and he, I did work with him that shot when I wasn't there, yeah. 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 That was a cute scene. <laughs> I'm wondering why they didn't do like a rap with him. <laughs> I know. If, these, if this film was shot now, that song, that, they definitely would have done a rap with them. 
maybe Corey Parker should come out and do a rap with it. He could be the next Eminem. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so what do you think about the legacy of this film now? Do you mean where it's going, or do you well, mean... Well, it's kind of it like um, every film kind of has its own life. Yeah. You know, you got part one, but, I mean, every film is kind of viewed differently. Like, um, um, you, you, do, you do a lot of the conventions, right? I do a few. I'm very selective which ones I do. Um, so I'm very surprised, especially in Europe... Okay. At how huge the Friday the Thirteenth franchise is. Yeah. The fans are so loyal. Not to say they aren't in America, but I expect it in America. I'm always surprised. You go to a small town in Germany, and it, you know the fans are lined up around the block. Wow. Even now, uh, all these years later. Very, very, very loyal fans to the Friday the 13th franchise. And that's a great thing. I <laughs> think I read an interview with uh, you online one time. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, one of the reasons that you ended up on the circuit is because you discovered that there was uh, uh, people selling fake autograph pictures of you online and that you figured yeah. that if, you, if they want an autograph, get the genuine thing. Well, but I, it bothered me. At first I said, well, you know. And then it kept going on and on, and people were contacting me and send, you know, showing me, faxing p the pictures with the signature and said, is this yours? And I was just so angry. I said, that's not my signature. And people were getting ripped off. So I contacted an agent and uh, said, how do I go about this? I'd like to make a few appearances where the fans can come and actually meet me and I can sign things right in front of them. And so that's when I did my first Monster Mania. But, uh, yeah, I, I hadn't done it before that, and I was contacted to do it, and I just didn't, I don't know, I felt uncomfortable going out and charging fans for autographs. But when I saw that they were getting ripped off from other people, by other people, yeah. I decided to go out and do it. Well, there's nothing wrong with charging for an autograph at a convention, you know. Some people are out of hand, like William Shatner, I heard, is way out of hand with it, you know. I mean, yeah. even George Decay has criticized him for it, and that's one of his own... Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. It's bad. I think it's out of control. I don't think it's right. Um, I'm not against charging, only because I have seen that I will sign something for someone, thinking it's for them, and they will go somewhere and sell it for $500. Wow. So I thought, okay, if you're going to do that, then I'm going to charge you a small fee, you know. Sure. For you making money off of me. Now, for the most part, fans are um, authentic, and they want you to sign something, and they keep it. They want their memorabilia signed. But there are a lot of people that uh, they're not really fans. They line up and you sign things and you see them literally a week later going for a lot of money. Wow. So they're just in it for the cash. Yeah, and you know that, what? That was a big surprise. I have autographs from way back in the 90s. I, I keep all my autographs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, it, but but you know, be honest. Tell me that this is that's what it's for. You well, know, where would I go to get an autograph of you? Do I just contact you on Facebook or? Yes, but I will send you something. You don't have to contact me. When we get off the air, you give me your information, and I will send you something. My oh, okay. I can send you a self-addressed stamped envelope. I don't mind doing that. Nah, it's fine. I will do that for you. Oh, I'll that's... get all your information and. Um, Yes, but for other people, they can contact me on Facebook. My website is in the process of being done. I've had two different websites, and um, there's a long story as to how I got ripped off on that. So I'm setting up another one. Um, but in the meantime, they can contact me on Facebook and, and if they want autographs. Well, you can... And I'm still, still doing shows. I still do conventions, so I will be sure to put on Facebook where, you know, where I'll be appearing, so in case I'm in particular person's uh, area they can come and see me you gotta come down here in canada 
I do. I was in um, very far away from you. I was in um, where was I? Uh, Calgary. Do you know where New Brunswick is? Yes, I do. Wow, I'm I'm surprised because nobody knows where we well, are. I'm originally from the east coast of uh, of the U.S. You know, I'm from um, Massachusetts. Okay, yeah, I saw that on. And you. then I have relatives in Maine, so I know. How far up you are. <laughs> there we go. We have a hard time even getting concerts up. But we get the Silver Wave Film Festival that goes on here in, in November. And I told my co-host, quit advertising Toronto Film Festival. Advertise Silver Wave, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. all we ever hear about is the Toronto Festival. Yeah, we got one. We advertise local talent and stuff. I mean, Joe Medjak, who produced Ghostbusters and whatnot. Wow. He's from here. Wow. Yep. Yeah. You ever hear yeah. of uh, the Trailer Park Boys? No. Oh, they're, they're um, a comedy troupe from here. Okay. Not from here in Fredericton, but they're from Halifax, I believe. Okay, yeah. Yep, they're very funny. I often, I wonder, you know, because I, I, a lot of the uh, critic, film critics in the States, I never see them um, review any of the Canadian films, and I'm like, come on. That's odd. I wonder why. You should check out the trailer part, boys. They, they're a TV show, but there's three movies. They're basically pot smokers. But okay, it's, like a Cheech and Chong kind of thing? Yeah, but it's hilarious. Okay, I will check it out. It is funny, and um, it's something I... The first one was actually produced by Ivan Reitman. I'm pretty sure you know who he is. Yes, of course. Yeah. So uh, he did the first one. I mean, you got um, Ricky at the beginning of it, and he's... Um, He's telling the camera how great his life is, and he's done up in all these nice, cool clothes, and he's got the sideburns and stuff, talking about how great his life is. Well, he's cooking fish and chips on the car or his tr- motor of his truck. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, so. No, I will check it out. I always love to find out new things. Yeah, we got that corner. Aren't new. <laughs> we got corner gas here too. It's another TV show we we pride ourselves on. And, oh, I'll check that out. Yeah, this corner. Is all good information for me. There you go. Yeah, I, I noticed that. And I, I, a lot of the American critics, they never check out the uh, stuff here in uh, uh, Canada, and I say we got some good stuff here. They need to broaden their horizons. I'll tell you. Yeah, but. Um, Anyway, I noticed on uh, your credit list you did some television. I, mm-hmm. I noticed you did Cheers and you did Hill Street Blues, and you played mm-hmm. a character named Tanya in both. Uh, isn't that hilarious? I know it. I just wrote not, that down. Not today. very creative. <laughs> <laughs> who I, I I don't watch a lot of television, so I must yeah. apologize. But uh, uh, who did you play? What was your role in Cheers? Cheers, I was a guest star. There was an um, an elderly man having his bachelor party. I was marrying this really old guy, and he was having his bachelor party at cheer at the uh, bar. And so all this stuff ensues, you know, hilarity, based on the fact that this guy is just an old codger, and I come walking in, you know, his bride to be. So it was um, a lot of build up, funny dialogue centered around that storyline with Sam Malone and, um, you know, uh, John Ratzenberger and all the guys, the regular characters. You must have made a beautiful bride. <laughs> it was just a fun, I mean, I, I worked for a whole week with them, and then we shoot it in front of a live audience, so I got to work with the the best people in television. Uh, Christie Alley was great. Just everybody was so fantastic, and we worked all week. Woody Harrelson became my friend on that shoot. And then uh, on the Friday night, we shoot in front of a live audience. So it was just the greatest experience, one of my best in my whole career. Oh, there you go. And Hill Street Blues, I'm not as familiar oh, with that. That was, that was just, that was great. Although that cast, Keel Martin, who has passed away, but my scenes were with him, and Wow. I mean, these were some of the best actors I had ever worked with. Daniel J. Travanti, he's also passed away. Um, the directors, just just great. I was very lucky. Very early on when I came to Los Angeles and television and film career, I got to work with some of the best people. Yeah. And you were also in another film I, I haven't seen called Best of the Best. 
Yeah, that's Eric, That's with Eric Roberts. You don't need to see it if you want to look for me because I, my character and every scene is completely cut out of the film. Oh, really? They, to make room for all the fight scenes. So my character doesn't even exist. Oh. And when, the, when the credits roll, there's my name and my character. Wow. So they have to pay me every time they show it. I get residuals and everything, but I'm not in the film. Can you believe that? Well, I guess I'm not watching it then. <laughs> no, I have all these scenes with Eric Roberts. I'm thrilled beyond belief to be working with him because at the time he was one of my favorite actors. And I'm completely cut out of the film. Oh, that's sad. But when the credits roll, there's my name. Oh. Well, yeah. tell me when... Everyone asks me about that. Yeah. Oh, my God, I see your name all the time and... I watch the film and I can't find you. So I tell everybody, they come to conventions and they have me sign best of the best things, you know, which is pretty funny. And I say, look, don't go. I'm not in the film. Cut. Completely cut. Well, here's don't a question. Don't think I wasn't yeah. irate. <laughs> irate. Yeah. I'm irate. <laughs> I won't that, wa- would have, that would have been really good for my career. I was so thrilled. They put me through the ringer to get that role. I mean, I had probably 15 callbacks. Oh. Finally get cast, finally get to do it. I'm on the set, working, working, working. Can't wait for this thing to come out, and I'm cut. Wow. But that is showbiz. Yeah. Well, tell me, when you do these conventions, like, um, you know, I had a crush on you growing up. How many guys do you have come up to your table and say that they had a crush on you growing up? You get that a lot? Funny, yes, and I'm always shocked. I'm just shocked. They all say this to me. Yeah. I'm not surprised. It just it really shocks me. You had the It's nice. It's so very nice, yeah. you know, but you you don't think about yourself that way. You just figured you did a film and you're not aware of the impact you have on other people. You had the But I found yeah. out the gorgeous blonde hair, those captivating eyes. You had oh, beautiful complexion. Thank you. There you go. And like I said, I, I've seen recent pictures. You you still look you still look good. I well, tell you no lie. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. So I've been uh, approached to write a book about how to uh, stay looking good as you age. So I may do that. Yeah. Well, I see a few pictures of you on Facebook, like um, Mm -hmm. some of your model pictures, you know. Mm -hmm. I just wish that you got to do um, some of your dancing in uh, a movie, you know. Yeah, that would have been good, but they didn't make those kind of, well, they did, but they weren't that many. They didn't make that many films where you could sing and dance. Because it would have been uh, interesting to to see that uh, side of you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um I know I heard that uh, you were originally supposed to be in Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives, and then they went the other way with it. Uh, right. What was that process like? Well, I, when I got Part 5, I was signed on to do 6. So I was already set to do two films back-to-back, which I was thrilled about. Uh, we wrapped Part 5. Everything was done, and they said they would be in touch in, within two months because they were going to start rolling the next one. Very soon after that, my agent contacted me and said that uh, they were going a different way. They couldn't do Part 6 uh, taking uh, where, where Part 5 left off because John Shepard did not want to do um, Part 6. And I couldn't do it. Pam Roberts could not come back without, John, without Tommy Jarvis. Yeah, but they had Tom Matthews play Tommy but in the compl- But it was a completely different... I think at that point when they realized that they couldn't pick up from Part 5, uh, that they had to go a completely different way, a completely different Tom, uh, Tommy, and um, they just went a completely different way. I don't think it was smart, but what do I know? I, I, apparently, Part 6 is fantastic. I haven't seen it. And it has a lot of fans, and uh, so they did a really great job with it. I personally think they should have taken off where Part 5 left off. Do you know what they were planning, like, for a screenplay, what Pam Roberts was going to be doing? I'm not sure. I know that Tommy was going to be the new killer. Oh. I'm not sure how long I would have lived. 
Oh, I, I hope they wasn't going to do with you what they did with Adrian King. I talked to Adrian King about that, you know. Yeah. She thought it was so ridiculous after the fight she put up with in the part one that they, they offed her at the beginning of part yeah, two. Yeah, that's what I mean. And it, it, it probably would have gone, I don't know, because it never went past uh, the discussion. Uh, some ways it was that I was going to live and I was going to turn him around and blah, blah, blah. But I, uh, it, you know, it's all hypothetical because it didn't happen. Well, that's uh, too bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, I hope that sometime that if you ever get the chance, you're more than welcome to come up here to Fredericton, New Brunswick. Um, uh, you can check out our Silver Wave Film Festival in November, and if you're ever in the Fredericton area, you can buy a CHSR. I and, will. Yeah, I'd Absolutely. love to meet you in person. Well, hopefully one day we will. Yeah, but um, but yeah, you, you what's that? It was great talking with you. Oh, it's 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 an honor, you know. It was a real honor. Um, I've only been doing the podcast, uh, like I've been on doing the show here since um, 2005, but we didn't start podcasting here since last year. And what had happened in April, my co co-host got us an interview through Rip Tracks to interview Tommy Wiseau of the Room. Oh. And after that, I was like. Who else can I interview? And I just wanted to go back to my past, and right. I wanted to talk to all the girl, all the women I had crushes on growing well, up. That's, well, that's a good place to start. <laughs> I talked to and Adrian. You can branch can't... out from there. You just tick them off the list. Okay, that, that, that. Yeah. You know. So, I mean, <laughs> I talked to a lot of people from cult films growing up, like the Friday the 13th. I mm -hmm. like talked to Adrian King, talked to Lisa Langles from Class of 1984, mm -hmm. and I did a... Uh, tribute to Zoe Tamerlos Lund from Miss Forty Five, and and um, and and works to get other people on. I'm, you know, I I enjoy talking to people from cult films. I find you guys have interesting stories. Whereas A list celebrities, they they we hear all about them all the time on the yeah, internet. All the time. Yeah, and they just go from job to job. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, they're out there all the time. So it's as if you know them. You hear about them all the time. You know their backstory. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was a great honor to talk to you. It was so lovely to talk to you. Yep, and I think you're gorgeous. Thank you so much, and thanks for taking the time to uh, seek me out and talk to me. I'm just going to let you stay on hold here so that I can close out my show, and then I'll give you my information. Okay. Okay? So just yeah. hold, okay? Okay. Okay. Well, that was Melanie Kenneman of Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning, and lovely to talk to her. She is so awesome. Uh, this is Python Hyena signing out. And um, hope you enjoyed the interview. We'll have you back um, the following week. This is Python signing out. Hi, this is Melanie Kinneman from Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. You're listening to CHSR 97.9 FM in Fredericton, New Brunswick.